Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is January 12th, 2018. Welcome from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the effects of the big storm and the big chill are still in evidence, especially compared with balmy Denver. Darlene and I traveled here for the funeral of my 11-year-old grandson James's father, Joe Felino, who was laid to rest here yesterday at the way-too-soon age of 43. We heard many things about Joe from friends and family who gathered to celebrate his life. A common thread was the power of his words, whether writing a young adult historical novel or a technical manual. Beginning in childhood, Joe was a wide and deep reader, and that's a characteristic that it turns out he shared with this week's guest, the best-selling author Dean Kuntz. Whatever I was reading through childhood and adolescence, it lifted me up and out, and I think it was all of that that made me want to be a writer. First up in news from the local paper of record here in the Boston area, the Boston Globe, this week carried an item which suggests that our fair city may have the inside track on the race to land HQ2, Amazon's second national headquarters. The Globe reported that Amazon is in talks to lease 500,000 square feet of space in Boston's Fort Point Channel neighborhood with an option to double the amount of space being discussed. The search for space in Boston, the Globe said, began before Amazon announced its HQ2 initiative last fall. Fortune picked up the story and opined that the Boston talks sound a lot like the first stage of the HQ2 plan. The total project of HQ2 envisions 8 million square feet of space costing $5 billion to build and housing 50,000 workers. But the first phase, opening in 2019, according to the Amazon request for proposals, was described as taking up 500,000 square feet, exactly the amount in play in the current talks uncovered uh, by the Boston Press. The Globe story written by Tim Logan quotes unnamed real estate industry executives with knowledge of the talks. It also states that the current search for space is being conducted separately from the HQ2 project. Now, Amazon already employs about 1,000 people in the Boston area. It's likely that they're going to keep hiring in the city, which is known for its very good universities, no matter where HQ2 ends up. I admit to feeling fired up yet again at the prospect of HQ2 coming to Boston, but there are 237 other proposals that were received, so the odds are long for any one city. By the end of this year, we will know who landed this big prize for economic development. Next in news, there has been a lot of coverage of Amazon and Google supposedly duking it out for artificial intelligence dominance at the giant consumer electronics show, CES, this week in Las Vegas. Uh, You can tell that Google wants to be seen as a serious competitor to Alexa at CES by the huge Hey Google ads on the side of the monorail cars serving the convention center. And there's a big Google booth on the exhibit floor. Apparently that's a first in recent years. By comparison, Amazon has no public presence on the show floor, but it has rented what the Financial Times called, quote, a sizable private space in Las Vegas's Venetian Hotel for meetings with partners. A Seattle Times story by Matt Day shows how Amazon's lower profile might be winning CES. Expansions of Alexa have already been announced for everything from a smoke alarm to a $1,300 smart mirror to a cutting-edge pair of smart glasses selling for $1,000 and personal computers by Lenovo and HP. The Seattle Times story states that though Amazon does not have a phone for Alexa to speak from, the Seattle giant is still leading the race to make software that can control other machines. That story also quoted an analyst with RBC Capital Markets estimating that Amazon sold 33 million Echo devices last year, up from 4 million units the prior year. A Fast Company piece by Mark Sullivan who was it was forwarded to me by John Sullivan, one of my listeners. Uh, it was titled, Here's Why Alexa Won CES Before the Show Even Started. Sullivan quotes eMarketer research showing that 68% of the 45.4 million Americans who will talk to an AI assistant in their homes by a speaker will start by saying Alexa or another Echo wake word. Google Assistant will garner only about a quarter of these total interactions. If you look at this year's actual product announcements instead of the ad buys, it's clear that Alexa is dominating this year's CES, Sullivan wrote. In addition to the previously cited Alexa devices, he added Alexa in some Toyota cars and Lexus vehicles in the U.S. later this year. 
The second phase of this platform war, according to Sullivan, is getting third-party hardware makers to build Alexa or Google Assistant right into the product instead of accessing a smart speaker. You talk to the lamp itself instead of asking your Echo to turn on the light. The way Amazon is winning this phase involves working with device makers in a flexible way. An analyst named Ben Bajaran wrote in a research note from CES that, quote, Amazon has been a better partner than Google in all of this, and, quote, this one insight alone is a key reason I think Amazon holds their lead here in markets where they compete. Uh, Darlene and I attended uh, CES seven years ago when there was an entire portion of the exhibit space dedicated to ebooks. <laughs> Those were the days. Uh, it was also when I, I think that's when I first got interested in smart cars because Ford was showcasing its Microsoft uh, My Ford Touch system, and we're still using that in our 2012 Ford Focus named Henry after the founder. I was worried was the hardware going to become obsolete during the, the time of having the car, but the software updates have, have kept it all working pretty smooth. I've been impressed with it. And we've got a Tesla Model 3 on order, so sometime this year we're going to take a big uh, step up again in, in terms of smart cars, I hope. If Darlie and I were at the Venetian again this year, I would be keeping track of Alexa and her competitors. But there's another product that I think I might be paying even more attention to. It's called the Puppy One, made by a Chinese company named 90 Fun in collaboration with Segway. I, I had one of the first Segway transporters when they came out in 2001, and it, it was an amazing ride. It also made me feel very conspicuous, but that's a price I'm often willing to pay in order to try out new technology. Google Glass is another example. The Puppy One is a suitcase small enough to carry onto a plane, and it balances itself on two wheels, just like a Segway. It kind of leans over, almost in the same angle as if you were pulling it, uh, and it follows its owner through an airport with some sort of wireless connection. I, I read about it in a Verge story last week, and I told Darlene I had every intention of buying one. She rolled her eyes and made it clear that she will probably be walking far enough away from me in an airport to make sure that no one suspects that the man with the suitcase following him is in any way related to her. My ardor for the Puppy One was, I admit, cooled when I saw a video demo actually from CES, a parking lot, and, and that was by a Verge reporter named Nat Garin. The demo began with a promising clip of the Puppy One rolling along on its own two wheels, but things went downhill quickly, as you'll hear in this excerpt. Now, this all sounds cool in theory, but when we took it out for a spin, the puppy just did not warm up to me. Like a real puppy, it sort of just followed me around and then ran away, or sometimes just fell over. Looks like this puppy didn't really go to a trainer. It also doesn't have obstacle avoidance built in because it's a prototype, which means if it's lost, it's kind of just gone. A smart luggage is supposed to make you feel less stressful about traveling. Before, all I had to worry about was just my bag made it to the final destination, and now I have to think about whether it's going to run away from me or plow through people at the airport. Now, it's just a working prototype, which means there are a lot of kinks to work out, but for now, it's like enlisting a puppy to pull your bag to the airport, and that's just about as useful as it sounds. Okay, I admit that doesn't sound very promising in the video. The puppy one looks truly pathetic as it rolls along and suddenly just does a belly flop on the pavement. But uh, I know a Len gadget when I see one, and this puppy has all of my early adopter hormones going crazy. There has been no mention of how much it will cost or when they will be available for purchase. If I can land one, I might take some recreational trips to Denver International Airport just to walk my suitcase around in the main terminal and then return by the A train to Union Station. Stay tuned, and <laughs> if you see me in an airport, stay out of the way. For the tech tip, I will have a link to a January 8th post at cultofmac.com titled How to Pair Your AirPods with Your Kindle Oasis by Charlie Sorrell. It's a nice step-by-step -step tutorial on how to hook Apple AirPods to your Kindle Oasis for wireless listening to Audible books. Darlene and I both have these AirPods. They, they look crazy. They look just sort of stupid hanging out of your ears with no wires, but they never fall out, and the audio quality is excellent for phone calls or listening to the TV when one of us would be disturbed by sound from the TV speakers. You can now connect the previous generation Oasis and the new Oasis to Bluetooth speakers, or in this case, the AirPods. I think it's an unlikely way to listen to Audible books. I agree with what Tom Sample said last week. Uh, and given that I have the Audible app on my iPhone, that's a lot better way to listen 
through a car's speakers or just on the AirPods. But it's kind of a cool additional thing that the Oasis can do. I think other Kindle models now have the same unlocked Bluetooth connection available, so you could use the AirPods with them as well. If you have Apple AirPods, the key step is to open the Bluetooth devices setting on your Kindle, and then you press the button on the back of the AirPods charging case after opening the case. You wait until the lights turn flashing white, and then the Kindle should see the AirPods and pair them, and you'll uh, be all set for some easy listening. Time now for the interview. At age 72, Dean Ray Kuntz shows no signs of slowing his literary output, which now stands at more than 65 novels, including many that have reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Previously published by Knopf and Penguin, he is now a Bantam Dell author. His audiobooks are created by Brilliance Auto, that is a uh, subsidiary of Amazon. I'd never read uh, Kuntz's work until Ricochet Joe appeared two weeks ago as an Amazon original story, free via my Kindle Unlimited subscription. I really liked it, and then I bought and read The Silent Corner, that's the first novel in his new Jane Hawk series, and there was a, a few chapters of that book were available at the end of Ricochet Joe. So it had the desired effect of at least uh, convincing one other person after reading the story to go ahead and buy one of the full-length novels. Ricochet Joe is Kuntz's debut with Amazon Publishing, and it features Kindle in Motion animation. I reached the author on Wednesday, January 10th at his home in Southern California. Hi, this is Dean. Hi, Dean. This is Len Edgerly calling from Cambridge, Massachusetts. How's the weather there this morning, or well, this afternoon, I guess? It's uh, sunny. They had a big storm and a deep chill, but it's now just more like regular winter. Not too bad. Uh, how is it in Southern California? Well, I don't want to rub it in, but, uh, you know, I walked the dog this morning, and it was so cold I almost had chapped lips. It was like 60 degrees. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, that's good. Well, uh, I'm excited to talk with you, and uh, are, are you, uh, we're set for 20 minutes. Is that still, you, you have 20 minutes to talk? Or? Oh, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I thought the first thing would be to set the stage for Ricochet Joe, uh, the story that you published two weeks ago, tomorrow actually, and uh, maybe let my listeners know who, who Joe Mandel is and how does he get into so much trouble in a single day the winter that he turns 18. Uh, well, uh, Joe is, I, I wanted to write a story about a, a guy who is almost a little bit like Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future, uh, that very sweet, naive uh, sort of young guy who then suddenly gets caught up in something uh, completely outrageous, although from that point on, uh, it doesn't go as nicely as things go for Michael J. Fox in the film. Uh, for Joe, things get darker and darker and darker until at the very end, it's very dark indeed. But there's always, in what I write, a little sliver of hope. So I just started with the premise of a story about some guy who's had a pretty even life that um, at his age, he's, he's 19 or uh, whatever, and he has had, a, other than losing his mother to cancer when he was very, very young and hardly remembers her, his life has been pretty much an even float. And all of a sudden, uh, he finds out the world is radically different than he ever imagined it was, and more complex levels are uh, occurring beneath the surface than he would ever have conceived, and he gets caught up in all of this. And it just was... Uh, you know, I write novel length most of the time, but sometimes the novelette length of 15 or 20,000 words is, is a lot of fun and quite a challenge, and I like to dip into it from time to time. So that's where, where the story evolved from, just a yearning to do something with that kind of character and also with a reasonable timeline, so I'm not looking eight months down the road before I finish it. How did it end up uh, being published as an Amazon original story? Actually, Amazon called me uh, and asked if I had uh, or would like to write a story for them that would have this uh, uh, type of uh, moving illustrations, I guess, partly animated illustrations. And I thought the concept of, of that was very intriguing. And uh, I looked around at what story ideas I had in the drawer. I Generally, when I get an idea, I write it down on a slip of paper and or a whole sheet of paper and stuff it in a drawer and never go back to them because there's always new ideas. 
But in this case, it was, do you have an idea? And I looked in the drawer and I thought, oh, yeah, there was this story um, and I've never gotten around to it. So they sort of instigated it by calling me. How long ago did they call you? Oh, this goes back quite a way. It took a long time to do the illustration. Uh, you know, I, I'd i have to go look at my records, but it goes well back, maybe a year or more. Oh, I see. Now, uh, the illustrations, is the Kindle in Motion animations really are well done. And uh, do you know Oliver Barrett before he worked on this project? I didn't know him at all, uh, but he's done a terrific job. But when they, they put forth his name, uh, they... As I remembered, they gave me two or three different illustrators to look at, and uh, and I chose him. And I said, "Wow, it's the uh, the hero of love story is now uh, illustrating uh, because <laughs> Oliver <Ollie>. Barrett was <laughs> exactly." <laughs> That isn't why I chose him. I chose him because of the brilliance of his artwork. Yeah, it also says he can deadlift almost four hundred pounds, so he's probably oh, well, he seems pretty fit. <laughs> I can deadlift about ten. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. Right. that's me too. Well, uh, what's your sense from kind of an artistic or literary uh, standpoint of what those uh, Kindle in Motion? graphics or animations add to the experience of the story? I think when they're as well considered as his were, and it, and it actually was uh, him working with all the folks at Kindle in Motion, which everyone there was just top drawer at what they were doing. Um, I think it adds something. You, of course, can turn it off and read the story without it, read the story with it. Uh, but uh, if it's well considered and thought through, um, then I think it, it uh, it enhances the story. Uh, they asked me when they when an uh, illustrator had been chosen. They asked me uh, what guidance would you give, and th- that was interesting because you don't usually get asked to give guidance to an illustrator. And uh, I said basically there were several things. One that Joe's character or his view of the world changes throughout and the imagery throughout the story go, goes from light to dark and I thought the story should start almost with a comic tone sort of like Back to the Future but as it goes it gets more and more noir and uh, and that the artwork should sort of reflect that so that was the largest guidance I gave him but I think uh, when you see the artwork then uh, it it gets edgier as the story goes, and that is, uh, I think, helps maintain the themes of the story and to uh, keep the mood of it right. So in that sense, it's kind of a fascinating new way uh, to look at fiction. One of my favorite uh, graphics was uh, set, it's Chapter 3, Ice Cream and Painful Loss, and it's set in the Lucky Duck malt shop. And this was back before it gets too dark. It's just the two characters at the malt shop. And the only, at first I didn't even see it, but the only motion is is uh, Portia's finger moving the straw in her malt, and everything else in the image is is fixed. And when you talk about the progression, it's almost as if that little bit of motion uh, maybe could be interpreted as uh, foreshadowing, or it, it certainly was subtle. Yeah, it's. Uh, I thought much of it was subtly done. I think you can look at these illustrations and how they work uh, after you've read the story and you know where it's all going. Uh, then you can go back and look at the illustrations and see things about them that you might not have noticed or thought about at first looking. Just would have thought, oh, that's kind of neat. But then when you consider where everything's going, some of those do, in a sense, forecast or foreshadow. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, I, I like the part where on the on the. Uh, title page your signature appears as if you're <laughs> your and was that strictly some kind of a program that did it or was somebody actually filming how you signed your name and mimicking it in that animation of your signature being signed all they did was ask me to sign my name and then they created that effect yeah my wife thought that was incredibly neat i know I, 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 it's, uh, I, I've watched it a couple of times. Yeah, it's kind of very cool. It feels personal. <laughs> it feels like you're signing signing my Kindle copy yeah. of the story. <laughs> the other thing that Rick Shea Joe has, and also uh, the Silent Corner, uh, has that X-ray 
feature that I see on some Kindle books, and it's kind of like the bones of the book. And one really handy thing is that it it, it will take show you a character like Joe or Portia, and then very easily show you all their mentions. Uh, and it's, it's you know in a shorter story like this, it's not so hard to keep track of the characters. But is that a, an aspect of uh, your books that you've been aware of when they show up in Kindle? And do you think it's a a help to readers? You know, I don't, I've never, I wasn't aware of that. You're telling me something. I <laughs> I do not reread myself that much because uh, once I've spent months and months working 70 hour weeks on a book and it goes off, I'm going to have to proofread it two or three times in the course of typesetting and all that with the general publisher. And after that, I I don't want to read it again for years. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you just have had way too much time with it, and you want to move on to something else. Yeah. There was a point in Ricochet Joe where the city council and the business owners of Little City recognized that the world is getting darker and more dysfunctional every year. Is that how you feel? Do you see the world getting darker every year, and, and that gets reflected in, in your books and your novels? Well, you know, I'm basically a very optimistic guy. I've uh, When you come out of a childhood like I did, uh, poverty, violence, and all of that, and you get into life and you end up at this point where I've ended up, you think, how could I not be an optimist? Uh, I'd be a fool. if I, I am a fool, but I'd be a worse fool if I wasn't an optimist. And, uh, and yet I am not blind to what happens in the world. And uh, there, there, is, uh, there are aspects of the world getting brighter and less poverty in the world than there was a hundred years ago by far. Uh, uh, advances in medicine and places and other technological functions that are wonderful. But then there are all these darker aspects. It's just the nature of human existence. But we're living in a time when those darker aspects can be, because of technology, because of all the modern elements of life that can empower evil, then the evil can be much more damaging than it could have been a hundred years ago. Um, and so I have to recognize both those aspects. Uh, in Ricochet Joe, it's the evil is it's all essentially otherworldly, but um, uh, in something like Silent Corner or Whispering Room or the An Eighth of Future Jane Hawk novels, the evil is right out there in the face of the uh, the lead character, and it's it's of human nature, not from another world. Um, so the Jane Hawk books reflect something I do believe we're, we're moving toward is technology having uh, really Orwellian applications or brave new world applications that aren't very pleasing to contemplate, but I think we need to contemplate them. Uh, this isn't as dark in my estimation. Ricochet Joe is nowhere near as dark as the uh, Jane Hawk books can get, but even in the Jane Hawk books, there is that that glimmer of hope at all times and and the, the feeling that the best in us can stand up against the darkest in us. Exactly. Well, now, at the end of Ricochet Joe, uh, I, there are five chapters from The Silent Corner. That's the first of your new uh-huh. Jane Hawk series. Uh, let, let's talk a little about her. Who 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 is Jane Hawk and what is she up against? Yeah, it, she came into my head, you know, sometimes you can look at a book and... Uh, when you're done with it, or even from the beginning, and know exactly where the idea came from. Uh, I've written one that came from a line in a Paul Simon song. Uh, and uh, then there are those that you are clueless to imagine where this came from. And Jane Hawk is sort of one of those. I just wanted to write something different. And I sat down and started this, well, I'm going to write about this FBI agent who is on leave, and before you get too far, she's actually gone rogue, and before you get to the end of book one, she's the most wanted fugitive in the United States. And I wanted to write a character, I said, I'm going to write a woman who is just as tough as any guy in any fiction series ever written, but not in any false way. She has to be strong emotionally, strong intellectually, and Physically, she's never going to be as strong as a 300-pound guy, but she doesn't need to be. There, Women can take care of men twice their size if they're properly trained. 
And I started to write her with that kind of thing in mind. And within very few pages, she took over the story. And I began to be amazed at things she did, things she said when I was writing dialogue scenes. My editors here and basically everywhere have said to me, we love the way she talks to the bad guys. And so do I. She's just... (laughs) She's really on the money with uh, with what she says and and how she says it and her psychological manipulation of people. And I got to the end of the book and really then said to myself, well, I know in a sense where she came from. She is uh, she is a sort of a blend of the strong women I've known in my life, and it's the nature of my life that the women in it have been much stronger than the men. My father was an alcoholic and given to gambling and women chasing and all that. But my mother, while she was a sickly person, was very strong in other ways. And I've had uh, everyone who guided me in life in the right way was a very strong woman from a high school English teacher who was a whack in World War II to my wife, who is probably the strongest woman. I've, and I don't mean physically because she's five foot one and <laughs> not usually strong that way, but in every other way, very strong. So in, other, in that sense, Jane came out of, I think, all those women I know. Interesting. I wondered if when you create a new protagonist or a new protagonist is kind of given to you the way Jane was, do they teach you something new about the human condition in kind of a fundamental way that you didn't know before you encountered this whole new fictional character? I think that you learn something. I was recently on an interview with a guy who teaches writing. He was one of the other interviewees, and uh, and he's very famous for teaching screenwriting and, and uh, also, to a lesser degree, fiction. And he said uh, he he takes issue with writers who say, I have to wait for the muse, uh, that, you know, there's something mystical almost about writing. And he said, no, there isn't. Um, everything that you write, whether you can see it or not, is a part of you. It's coming from within you, and it's knowledge you have, feelings you've felt. And it may sometimes seem strange. Where does that come from? I disagree with him. I think there is, a, to some degree, truth in that. And I certainly don't wait around for the muse to strike, or otherwise I would, you know, I'd I'd still be reading books rather than writing them. But uh, you have to keep moving forward every day. But there is something uh, about writing when it's really flying, and and I don't mean you're getting 20 pages a day. Really flying could be four pages a day out of a 10-hour day. But when it feels right and it's flowing and you're not doing the 30 drafts a page, you're doing 10 or whatever, there is something about it that is not, it seems to me, I don't know if muse is the right word, but there is, you're in touch with something else besides yourself. And uh, it's fascinating to me. And it's the haunting part of writing that, uh, and I've talked with other writers who feel the same thing and can't quite put words to it. But uh, you do learn stuff about the human condition or the ways to deal with it. Like in the Jane Hawk books, the way she deals with some things, uh, I find kind of astounding and, and kind of uh, really um Admirable. I mean, she's up against horrific forces, and uh, uh, and she doesn't despair, and she doesn't become uh, well. She becomes angry, but she doesn't become embittered. And and how she holds that uh, that way in a darkening world is has been eye opening to me. And I've said to myself a couple of times, you know, you should lighten up the things going on in your own life that you sometimes. I'm talking about myself. Yeah. Uh, things that happen in my life that I get exacerbated about uh, are not sufficiently terrible given what can happen to other people to get exacerbated about. And if Jane can deal with what she's dealing with, which is, (laughs) it's not the same as The Walking Dead, but it almost might as well be. She's got terrible forces after her. If she can deal with this, and I can see that it makes sense the way she deals with it, then try to be more like her day-to-day and relax a little. <laughs> exactly. Well, now the third book in that series, The Crooked Staircase, is available for pre-order now with delivery on May 8th. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what happens to Jane in that story? Well, Jane is boring in, in this conspiracy. All of these books 
it's a five book arc to, to launch Jane. Uh, and, but in that arc, each book pretty much is a standalone. You can enter the series anywhere, though it's more fun to enter at the beginning, I think. Uh, in this one, Jane is boring into the conspiracy deeper and it, I, I just don't want to give anything sure. away. A, a friend of mine who publishes the limited of these called me up and said, I was in such a dark place that <laughs> with toward the end of this book that when his girlfriend came into the room, he jumped two feet out of the chair. <laughs> I said, good. That's exactly what you're supposed <laughs> that's to That's what do. I'm going for. <laughs> and, and there's a place at the end of it which puts her, uh, puts something she values greatly at great risk. And it's, um, I'll, I'll say no more, but, uh, but I have, I'm just, she's fascinating to me and, uh, maybe, well, I don't know. I've written so long and so many, but she's right up there with the top three characters I've ever written. And, uh, people in my publishing life keep telling me she's the best one, but you know, I love all my children. So. <laughs> well, now, uh, looking at what you've accomplished, you talked about why, you're, why you're an optimist and some of these numbers are pretty amazing that your books have sold over 500 million copies worldwide and, and 17 million more copies each year. I'm curious, someone that is writing from a spiritual place and obviously is driven by deeper things than just counting numbers or, or money. What do those numbers mean to you in the context of what you've done as a writer? Well, first you have to know that when my wife uh, said, uh, when I was writing and uh, not making a living at it, but making some money. Uh, and I was teaching school, and she said, I will support you for five years, and if you can't make it in five, you'll never make it. Uh, and I leaped at that. So the rest of the family thought I was an absolute scoundrel, a bum. <laughs> and, a, and, uh, uh, and it took almost those five years. But when we had that conversation, uh, it was how much do I need to earn for us to have a good life? Uh, and we decided if I could make 25000 a year, that would be a good life. Hmm. Now, this was back in 19, when was it, 69. Uh, so it was more money than now, but still it wasn't anywhere a fortune. And that it became what it became has always been an amazement to me. And there are days, well, there's more days than not, because I always operate with a lot of self-doubt that I'm sitting here and I'm not sure this is um, that's going right or that what I've just written is the right direction. And you get into that where you start tying yourself up in knots. So the I my office and Jura's office are on a hallway that's about, I don't know, 50 feet long, and on both sides it's lined with floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. And the only books in that hallway is one copy each of each of my books in each language and each time the cover changes. And so I've got like 8,000 editions, unique editions, in the hallway. So when I'm in one of these knotted conditions, I, I walk out there and just stand and look around and say, okay, you did this before, damn it. You can go back in there and do it again. <laughs> That's a good physical uh, icon to, to keep you going. Hmm. Well, some other questions that occurred to me as I was thinking about, uh, obviously dogs play a big role in your writing. And uh, if, if you were to be reincarnated and come back as a dog... Do you know what breed you would choose to be? Well, everybody knows I'd want to come back as a golden retriever because right. I've had three of them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they, each one is just as unique in a personality as any three human beings. And, uh, and they're... You know, we work with a charity that provides assistance dogs for people with severe disabilities. And for many years, they kept trying to get us to accept a, a, what used to be called a... a a fail, failed out, a dog that failed out of the program. They, they might have gone through 21 months of 24 months training before they decided it just wasn't going to make it. Now they no longer say it failed out. They say it had a career change. But <laughs> political correctness is even to the dog world now. So we don't want any dog having a bad moment. That's but, right. uh, and she, uh, uh, but Elsa now came to us and and uh, we said, no, no, we're too busy for so long. And my greatest regret, well, one of my greatest in life, is that we didn't say yes to a dog much sooner. 
they have they have been the greatest blessings in our lives. They are, they just make you laugh every day. They keep you grounded. Uh, their their desire for affection reminds you that the people in your life need your affection, just as the dog needs yours. And uh, there's so many things about them that keep you centered. So uh, I said, and they're so much smarter than people give them credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, our dog did a couple of things the other day, and, and she's the learning language. I, I know from experience that an assistance dog can easily know 400 words. Wow. Um, and, uh, but Elsa uh, is putting, she's adding words, uh, and we notice when she suddenly knows this word now, a new word, or that she's heard a number of times, and she likes it. So they're French fries, for instance. She, <laughs> She didn't need a long time to learn what that was. Her uh, ears perk up. Yep. Her whole attention. She'll whip around. In, you know. And uh, uh, so it's it's kind of fascinating how smart they are. And, in fact, after she'd done two or three really sort of smart things right in a row, I said to her, you know, humanity should be damn glad dogs don't have thumbs. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd be in trouble. But We'd be on the other end of the leash. Yeah. <laughs> uh, children's books. I, I think that you're familiar and, and uh, know a lot about children's books. If, if you were going to recommend to uh, someone with a grandchild under the age of five uh, looking for a good book to read to a, a child, you know, sort of at the beginning age of being able to listen to a book, what, what would be some of the books that you would recommend? Uh, you know, I have a, a, a five. I'm trying to think whether NAPs would work at that low, but you get up to about eight. Uh, five, for me, would have been more picture book. But yeah. uh, but I am just a rabid fan of Kate DiCamillo, uh, uh-huh. who wrote Tale of Despero and uh, the Winn-Dixie or any of her books. I just think she's terrific. And she wrote a little book called The Magician's Elephant, which is says as much in about 200 pages of, of big print <laughs> as I could say in a novel that was 600 pages of small print. And so I just find her kind of fascinating. So I I frequently recommend Kate Ticamillo for all those ages from, I, I think anybody at six or seven, mm-hmm. maybe even younger, could have Tale of Despero or some of these other books of hers read to them, and I think they would just be delighted by them. Yeah, exactly. Who is your favorite poet? Oh, I have to say, well, I'm big on poetry. I read a lot of poetry, but I, I would say simply for the for the accomplishment of the four quartets, it would have to be T.S. Eliot. I've uh, I've read those so many times, that, but. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of people I I really like and uh, but I I've read the four quartets over and over and it just astounds me he he essentially changed the whole way poetry could be done and so completely changed the idea of how you could use language to create feeling and and uh, and to convey very complex ideas uh, that uh, it's hard to touch. Uh, I, I would put him up there with uh, Shakespeare. But. Have you written any poetry yourself? Yeah, we won't talk about most of it. I, <laughs> I, uh, I wrote some poetry years ago when I was looking for an epigraph to open a novel, uh, and I couldn't find exactly what I wanted uh, that conveyed some of the themes. Then I would write it, and I would attribute it to something called the Book of Counted Sorrows. And it never crossed my mind that I was creating monumental problem for librarians. But <laughs> after I had done this for a while, I started getting letters from my librarians, and it got up until I was getting hundreds of letters a year from librarians saying, I have just spent you know six hours, <laughs> ten hours, whatever the hell it was, trying to find this book of counted sorrows that people keep asking me about. What is this book? And then I'd have to sort of sheepishly write back and say, it doesn't exist. I made it up. And uh, so uh, I, my, I probably have my picture in a lot of libraries with a big red circle around it and a red bar line right through my face. But uh, but I eventually did, we did publish it first as a limited, then as a sort of trade book. And, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so it exists out there now. But I put those poems in it, but then I wrote a ridiculous 
sort of uh, comic uh, introduction to it uh, about where all these poems came from because uh, I didn't actually want to take credit for some of them. Uh, my listeners are uh, big fans of ebooks, the Kindle. Uh, do, do, do you have any sense of how many people read your books uh, on paper versus ebooks? And, and do you care? Or do you have any sense of what the difference is reading one of your novels? in one format or the other? All I care about is they read them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, if they read them, it, for me, reading them in, digitally, reading it on a Kindle or reading it in a book, I, I, I'm just as happy about either version as I am uh, that they're reading it in Swedish, for instance. Right. Uh, and uh, so it's it's all of this. When I was a kid growing up in a bad situation, it was fiction and it was people who wrote it that gave me a door into a world that I didn't otherwise know existed. When you grow up in a dysfunctional house with violence and, and poverty, there's a tendency to think that everybody, this is when the doors close on other houses, this is the way it is inside. And it was by reading that I really learned that, no, there are, there are infinite number of ways to live, and a lot of them better than the way uh, that I was living then. And so they were very inspiring. I mean, even if I was reading whatever I was reading, Ray Bradbury or theater, I read a lot of science fiction, Theodore Sturgeon or uh, Robert Heinlein, and then later Mystery Suspense and then Dickens. But whatever I was reading through childhood and adolescence, it lifted me up and out. And I think it was all of that that made me want to be a writer. I I thought it would be the most amazing thing. If out there in the world somewhere there was a kid reading something, or an, an adult for that matter, that was really getting to them and affecting them as so many people had affected me. And you didn't even know that w- who they were or where they were. And I, it just struck me as a kind of magical thing to be doing. And uh, so because I was a reader, that's really why I became a writer. I have been speaking with the best-selling author Dean Kuntz, author of Ricochet Joe and a new series based on the heroine Jane Hawk. Thanks very much, Dean. Thank you. You made that easy. In content, Darlene and I were glad to see that Amazon's The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel TV series won two Golden Globes. Rachel Brosnahan won Best Performance by an Actress in a Television Series, Musical, or Comedy for her starring role as Miriam Maisel, a plucky housewife in the 1950s Manhattan who remakes herself into a highly original comedian after her husband leaves her. It's fiction, a creation of Amy Sherman Palladino, who created another guilty pleasure favorite of Darlene's and mine, the Gilmore Girls. Jeff Bezos attended the awards ceremony in Hollywood, looking sharp in a tux, sitting next to his wife, Mackenzie, a very stylish couple these days. And here is part of Sherman Palladino's acceptance speech. Um, I want to thank Amazon because ha, their support was completely unwavering at all times. Every check cleared. We could not have found a better partner. Thank you. We're never leaving. Thank you for fixing the door. I'm not sure what that's a reference to, but I think it shows that in things big and small, from uh, major financial backing to fixing an errant door, the experience of working with Amazon Studios was a positive one, and it certainly must have felt good up there in that stage of the Golden Globes. That's it for this week. I want to thank those of you who reached out with condolences for the loss of my son-in-law, Joe. Uh, We had the funeral yesterday here in Cambridge, and my grandson, who will be 12 next month, James, uh, it, it was a remarkable thing to see him there in the front row at the church and taking in the scene, the number of people who came to honor Joe's life and celebrate it uh, in his dignity in the calling hours. Uh, you know, a, a young man uh, thrust into an event that obviously was extremely difficult, and he carried it off with great grace. So I was proud of him, and the, the family all came together on you know, a, a tragic event. There's, there's no, no other way to describe it. Next week's guest will be Hafiza Geeter, who, as it turns out, was the last editor of Amazon's innovative and high-quality digital literary magazine, Day One, that was launched in October of 2013, and it ended this month. We will find out why the magazine was uh, brought to an end and what else Amazon's literary imprint, Little A, has planned in the future. 
Music for my podcast is from an original Thelonious Monk composition named Well You Needn't. This version is Ra Monk by Eval Monagat on the Variations in Time, a Jazz Perspective CD by Public Transit Recording. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think we're going back to Denver next week, uh, but some things have come up that I might be able to help my folks out with, so we're, we're in a bit of limbo as to exactly when we'll be returning to Denver. But wherever we are, I'm glad to bring the show to you. I hope you have a great day. Bye. Bye.